final course here. It's an honour to present to you a researcher from Oxford University. Her name is Kat, indeed. Her name is Katerina, and she is sweet and cold like ice cream. There we are. Hey. Yeah, so um, I'm Katarina and, and I'll be talking about the science behind that gut feeling. Um, so as you guys are probably starting to realise by now, um, you might not be quite who you think you are. Um, and sort of roughly speaking, we're half human and half bacterial cells. Um, but the most recent estimates actually suggest that the number of human and bacterial cells in our body might be so similar that basically before you go to the toilet, you're more bacteria than human, and then sort of after you've um, you know, cleared your gut contents, you're more human than bacteria. <coughs> and so this is kind of cool because it suggests that we almost have this like daily fluctuation between being more bacteria and more human cells. Um, and as Doug said, the majority of these bacteria live in our guts. So our guts house over 100 trillion microorganisms. Um, and this is actually more than the number of stars in the whole of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, and together, our um, bacteria um, within our bodies weighs approximately three pounds. Um, and that's roughly equal to the weight of our own brains. I like to think that's kind of a nice coincidence, because my own research actually looks at how the bacteria living in our guts um, can affect our brain and behaviour. Um, and whether they may even contribute to things like our personality. Um, so yeah, I'll be telling you about some of the cool recent research um, behind um, the science to do with that gut feeling um, and show you that there is actually evidence that bacteria living in our guts can really influence the chemistry of our brains. Um, some of you are probably pretty dubious right now. Um, maybe you think you're in the pseudoscience camp by mistake. Um, but let me convince you otherwise. Um, so, uh, research um, in this area is sometimes tricky to do in humans. Uh, so, um, some studies uh, often use lab mice. And there are naturally different types of mice. So, some mice are very aggressive and others are quite shy. Um, and one of the first really convincing studies that was actually carried out a few years ago by some researchers found that if you take all the gut bacteria from the aggressive mouse and all the gut bacteria from the shy mouse and you basically swap their gut contents, then they actually take on the temperament of the individual from whom they receive the gut bacteria. And so the aggressive mouse becomes more shy because its gut was colonized by a bacteria from the shy mouse um, and vice versa. And so this was a really key study revealing that actually our gut bacteria may contribute to um, how we behave. Um, but that wasn't just a fluke. Um, and more recently people have done some studies, for example, if you take gut bacteria from people that are depressed, and if you colonize the guts of mice with these bacteria, they actually start, um, pretty much makes the mice upset. Obviously we can't tell what's going on inside the mind of a mouse, um, but we can kind of use standard behavioral tests to see how they respond to certain tasks. Um, and in this way they could assess sort of their degree of depressive-like symptoms. Um, and there are other ways that our gut bacteria are linked to our um, behavior as well. Um, so some people um, working in this area um, use specially bred mice and they're actually born and they live their whole lives with no bacteria at all. Um, and obviously this is quite an extreme case that you wouldn't find in nature. Um, but these um, germ-free animals actually show impairments in their social behavior and in their social communication. Um, and some studies find that you can actually rescue these social deficits by introducing just one specific type of bacteria. And often that's um, a bacteria belonging to lactobacillus. So you might have heard of lactobacillus because it's commonly used in ingredients like probiotic yogurts. Um, so this whole kind of area of research is also really relevant for trying to understand conditions like autism, uh, which is characterized by um, impairments in social behavior. Um, and actually, it's often accompanied by um, digestive and gastrointestinal issues as well. So you guys have probably wondered, how on earth does this all happen? How does our gut bacteria communicate with our brain? Um, and to be honest, that's really a question that we're still grappling with um, in the field at the moment. So uh, there's a gut, we know that there's a main nerve that goes directly from our gut to our brain um, called the vagus nerve. 
Um, and this does seem to be important in allowing bacteria in our guts to be able to influence the chemistry of our brains. But um, some studies find that this nerve doesn't always play a role. And in recent years, it's come to light that our immune system might be very important. So the bacteria that live in our guts um, regulate our immune response. And they basically make sure that our body knows how to deal with potentially bad bacteria and also you know, appropriately respond to um, infection. And in turn, we know that the state of our immune system can affect our mood and our psychological well-being. So we think that one of the main mechanisms by which our bacteria may affect our brain might be via tweaking our immune response. But one of the really intriguing things is that bacteria living in our guts can actually produce chemicals of identical structure to our brain's own neurotransmitters. So our brains produce um, neurotransmitters and these are chemicals that send signals along nerves. So you might have heard of neurotransmitters like serotonin which is commonly referred to as a happy chemical, or dopamine, which is important for giving us feelings of reward and pleasure. Um, but even if bacteria in our guts do make these neuroactive chemicals, at the moment we don't really know how relevant that is. So can, can it somehow affect our brain? Maybe, for example, it might be able to travel through the bloodstream, or to be able to trigger um, the nerve that goes directly from our gut to our brain. Uh, but it's a possibility, but it's pretty much not researched um, at the moment. Um, and one other possible mechanism is that when our gut bacteria help us to break down our food, they produce a number of waste products. And some of these waste products, like fatty acids, um, are actually well known to have effects on our brains. Um, so, you know, should we, should we think about changing our gut microbiome by changing our diet? Um, could that even affect how we behave? You know, are there certain foods that we should think about eating if you want to be uh, more extroverted or more outgoing? Um, well, we actually have amazing diversity between us in our gut bacterial communities. So if you look from one person to the next, we only um, have in common roughly 20% of our bacterial species. And also, our own gut communities are really remarkably stable. So if, for example, you have an upset tummy or you suddenly change your diet, um, your gut bacteria, after a few days, will quickly go back to what it was before. Um, although, having said that, there are certain diets that are associated with particular types of bacteria. So if you eat a lot of fiber, like we had for our starter, um, you're more likely to have a higher abundance of bacteria that specialize on breaking down fiber. Um, and I often get asked the question whether I take probiotics. Um, so probiotics are these live um, bacteria that are often added to things like yogurts. Um, but the thing is that the strains that are used in these food products aren't actually identical to the strains of bacteria that naturally occur in our guts. And um, moreover, if you're healthy and you haven't taken, for example, antibiotics, which can deplete your gut bacteria, then most of the evidence seems to suggest that any additional bacteria that you, you consume um, largely just passes straight through because our own bacteria, our own guts are so teeming with our own bacteria that it's very difficult for it to colonize. Um, but the jury is still out on whether there are specific health benefits of taking probiotics. Uh, but interestingly also, if you actually look across cultures, a lot of cultures have natural probiotics in their diets. So if you think of things like fermented food, like cheese, um, sauerkraut, soy products, and also Asian dishes like kimchi and miso soup. And so, sort of maybe from an evolutionary perspective, um, you know, these uh, recipes with these natural probiotics has passed through generations because we kind of know that it's good for our health. Um, my own research actually also looks at something called prebiotics. So prebiotics are a particular type of fiber um, and so rather than taking um, live bacteria as you have in probiotics, prebiotics is a type of fiber that promotes the growth of certain bacteria and this is particularly bifidobacterium and lactobacillus that have been associated with good health and they're also known to have beneficial effects on behavior like reducing stress and anxiety and also improving social behavior. Um, and this prebiotic fibers actually occurs naturally in foods like asparagus, um, chicory, onion, garlic, 
Um, and it's also in slightly tasty foods as well, like we have here today, like banana and um, dark chocolate. So there are actually starting to be um, some studies in humans looking at whether changing our gut bacteria can affect our brain and our behavior. Um, and so for instance, um, there was a study where people were given this prebiotic fiber um, and they were only taking it for three weeks. And afterwards, they found that it actually reduced the levels of cortisol in the body. So we look at cortisol as a mark of stress. Um, and this is interesting because it suggests that by manipulating our gut bacteria, we might actually be able to not only affect our body's physiology, you know, but also how we feel and our mood. Um, and ultimately, working in this field is really um, exciting potential to translate some of our findings to the clinic. Um, and so some initial animal studies actually suggest that changing gut bacteria might be just as effective, if not more so, than commonly prescribed antidepressant drugs. And just one um, uh, final thing that I thought would be quite relevant here today is that it's not actually just bacteria living in our guts that can affect our brain, but also even soil bacteria. Um, so a study found that a commonly occurring bacterium in the soil can actually trigger nerves in the brain to produce the happy chemical serotonin. And this is thought to be through activating our immune system. Um, and um, interestingly, it actually increases the release of serotonin specifically in parts of the brain that we know are involved in regulating our mood and how we feel. Um, and so I kind of wonder, you know, maybe that's one of the reasons why everyone enjoys music festivals so much because of all the wallowing in the mud. Um, but just one final thought to finish on. We not only have bacteria that live in every nook and cranny within us, but actually all around us as well. And we have our own basically unique microbial cloud. Um, so whilst I've been speaking uh, to you today, you've probably emitted roughly a quarter of a million microbes, uh, many of which have probably shed onto your uh, neighbors. So I hope you guys are sitting next to people with friendly microbes. But actually most of the studies suggest that the more diverse our microbial flora, the better. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks for listening. I, um, you can probably tell that this is a really new field um, with loads of unanswered questions, uh, but that's what makes it really exciting and fun for us to work in as scientists. Um, but you can try and ask away and I'll see if I can answer them for you. Oh, Katarina, thank you! Woo! Yeah. 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 We've got time for a few questions if anyone there. Uh, has the urge, any queries, questions? Yes, we have that one person. Human being in simply act as a host of bacteria. Is that the entire purpose? Um, yeah, I mean, we are a host of bacteria. Uh, people used to think that the womb was sterile, but now it seems like even the womb isn't actually sterile. But basically, when, when you're born, you're colonized with bacteria, and that's a very important time in your life because it's when your immune system learns what types of bacteria are good and what types of bacteria are bad. And um, so uh, research at the moment is also looking at things like whether cesarean section might have an effect on the types of bacteria um, that you're born with, because it seems like you know, um, people born by cesarean section might actually um, be colonized by a different ecosystem of bacteria compared with people who are born naturally. Um, and so it is really important. And yeah, we just accumulate um, microbes as we age, um, but also as we age, the types of bacteria that live in our guts also tends to change as well. Answer, answer. Oh, lovely. <laughs> I'm coming over here, madam, to you. Yes. Right. Hello. Hi, it's uh, Yeah. Right. Uh, my question is about um, intolerances and allergies. Whether you think that is genetic or whether they are traits uh, that are activated or deactivated by the gut bacteria. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, we know that, um, like, basically, uh, for every one gene we have, our, our, our microbiome has another 150 genes. So in terms of gene number, we're really outnumbered. Um, I mean, specific, some autoimmune diseases may be characterized because of our own genes. Um, but um, a lot of research in the field is really suggesting that um, many autoimmune conditions might actually arise because the types of our gut bacteria uh, might mean that our body 
doesn't learn which bacteria to respond to. So we end up thinking uh, some bacteria is bad when it's actually okay, and then that's why we sort of like uh, respond too much and have autoimmune conditions. But it might also be an interaction between our own gut bacteria and our own body, so maybe they can you know, switch our own genes on and off as well. Roger, any more? Behind you. Oh, there we are. <laughs> does overlap with things like IBS because it's often, very often accompanied by stress and anxiety. Um, and so, you know, that might be, you know, because our, our whole environments are getting way more stressed in these days, living in cities, and that might be one of the factors contributing to it. Um, we don't know, like, cause and effect in this microbial world is really hard to tell, but some studies do suggest that it might be because we're stressed and anxious and that affects our gut because we know that um, if you're stressed, it can actually um, affect the types of bacteria living in your gut. Um, so it's not only that the gut can affect our brain, but it's a two-way communication. So how we feel in our brain can also affect our guts. Um, and so there are some studies suggesting that if you're stressed, it actually reduces um, the number of uh, good gut bacteria, and then that leaves it open for potentially sort of bad disease-causing bacteria to take over. So don't get stressed. We're not stressed. <laughs> it's really hard to say as a PhD student, but yeah. No, no, it's good. We we have faith in you. For um, we've enjoyed what you've served up. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed the smorgasbord of friendly bacteria. What a great thing. Tastes good, feels good, is good. Um, now this dinner party would have been nothing without you, good guests. Um, but also it would have been a shadow of this former self without our wonderful speakers here today. So let's have a big round of applause for this party. Now, that is the end of our dinner party, but it is not the end of Gorilla Science. We are here, we are